Good morning. It's the 27th of June. I'm David and this is the Pisgah Sunday Reflection. In fact, it's the last Pisgah Sunday Reflection. Um, it's been something of a journey, certainly throughout the, the autumn, winter, early spring period, some of the worst periods of pandemic and lockdown. We've been meeting every Sunday, reflecting on the Bible, looking for sources of hope and light, the light that shines in the darkness. And it's been really helpful to me. And I'm so grateful that you've joined me on that journey. Those of you who have viewed and sent feedback and comments through watching the videos. Um, I found it really helpful and I hope you have too. But now that the majority of us are returning to chapel and Sunday services and the viewing is going down significantly now, it was felt that my time needs to be better invested elsewhere instead of producing these videos. So we're going to put them aside for a time. Should there be another period of lockdown, we will restart them, although I, God forbid, I, I wouldn't want that to happen. But it is sad to be saying goodbye. But keep watching this space. There might be the odd special video from time to time. Perhaps one of those for, for, for the days for the Church Across Pembrokeshire site, which I will also upload here. Now, for this final one, we're looking at the whole of Acts chapter 10. I'm not going to inflict the whole of Acts chapter 10 on you. We will be doing that to the folks in Pisgah later. In fact, I'm spreading it between two readers so it's not too difficult to listen to. I'm not going to do that to you, especially on our very final time together. I'm just going to read a portion of the text. But before I read that part of the text, just give you some context. Um, God's telling a man called Cornelius to go to Peter, the head of this new movement called The Way, but it would later be called Christianity. Cornelius is a Roman centurion and God wants to reveal to him the fullness of what this faith's about, of actually fully receiving Jesus and his Holy Spirit. But in order for Peter to actually accept Cornelius and minister to him fully, God's got to deal with his prejudice first. Peter's been brought up to believe that non-Jews are unclean, that you can't even go into the home of an unclean person. God's got to show him that what Peter thought was unclean, God is calling clean. So he's preparing the way. If you're feeling super holy, by all means, press pause and read the whole of chapter 10. It'll be great preparation for this. But if you're not quite feeling it this morning, you might just want to read with me this little portion. It's Acts 10, verses 9 to verse 16. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. And it was like change. I don't like change. I once heard it said that the only people who like change are wet babies. And even they kick up a fuss, in my experience, in the middle of being changed. Change is hard. There's a story in the biography of, uh, of Henry Ford, the founder and great innovator of the Ford Motor Company, the man who made the, the iconic Ford Model T. Now, it went on for years and years and years in pretty much its same guise, always black. But people within the company were starting to suggest to him that maybe it was time to change the colour a little bit, look at something a little bit snazzy, and Henry uh, had become stuck in his ways. He was angry at the suggestion that there should be change, that his brilliant prototype even needed changing. 
Now, one of his staff, a chap called William Dunson, he was a production manager. He said, we're never going to convince him with our words. Only by showing him that change works will we be able to persuade him. So William, in his spare time, started to actually make a, a prototype of a Model T, an updated version, and he painted it bright red. Now, eventually, they wheeled this car out in front of Henry, and Henry was so furious that he grabbed a big wrench, he started smashing it into the bodywork of his new prototype car. He managed to wrench one of the doors off and throw it onto the floor. He was mad. And one of the things that infuriated him most, he said later, was the fact that it was red and not black. This man was a great innovator. But even he had become quite set in his ways and incredibly change resistant. He closed his mind to it. Now, of course, we Christians aren't like that, are we? Ha ha. Uh, I remember speaking to, um, I won't mention names, but uh, a member from Broadhaven Chapel around about the time that they'd decided to take all of the pews out of the chapel and have chairs because they didn't have um, complete access to their rooms. Um, the rooms they used, it for, they used for out of Sunday activities. It was a bit of a community space. They wanted more fle flexibility in their sanctuary. So they've been pushing for this for years and years and years. Uh, and this member told me that they literally, they couldn't have got rid of the pews earlier because they'd have had to have broken one of the biggest commands to do so. What's that? I asked. We'd have had to have killed people. We'd have had to have, there'd have been bodies everywhere, he said, because the number of people who said over our dead body, will this change come? Will the pews be removed? What was remarkable? And yet there were a number of people in the church who felt that the only way that they could go forward is if they had the flexibility in their main space. And so it came about and they changed it. But change isn't easy. I personally don't like change. I like the idea of change, but then often the reality of change is somewhat more discomforting. Looking at our text today, we see that change is not a new problem. It's an ancient problem. It's particularly a problem in our faith because we're often being shaken to the core when God challenges our attitudes, our prejudices, our current ways. To be fair to the people in the text, to be fair to Peter, the change that they're envisaging is huge. It's not just a bit of a structural change. It's not a few pews here and there. It's a fundamental life altering, faith shaping change. In fact, it's so big that God has to go about preparing Peter with three dreams, three sort of visions in the trance he went into. So he sees this large sheet being unfold, coming down from heaven on it, all kinds of birds and reptiles and animals. But they're all unclean ones, all the ones that spiritually Jews aren't allowed to partake from. And then the command goes up in the vision, get up, Peter, go kill and eat. No, Lord, I've never had anything unpure or unclean, says Peter. Do not call anything that I have made clean unclean, warns God. So this happens three times and Peter's left just scratching his head in baffled wonder. What does this mean? Then representatives from a very powerful Gentile, a man called Cornelius, a Roman centurion, come along and say that their master Cornelius is inviting Peter to go to him. But God has asked Cornelius to invite Peter to go to them and tell them all about Jesus. Now, Peter wasn't a fool. He might have been hard headed and rather stubborn, but he wasn't a fool. He put two and two together, the dream, the vision, and now this invitation, it must be linked. So whereas probably previously he, well, he would have refused to go with the servants to Cornelius's house, to this unclean house, he wouldn't have been allowed to under religious law. Now following that dream, he sees that it's what God actually intends. So God was preparing Peter to accept the invitation to Cornelius. But that didn't make it any easier for Peter. 
I'm sure lots of you, especially people of a certain generation, have had their times tables drummed into them by rote. And so I'm sure they're there, they're stuck in your head. Young Jewish children had a similar experience, but with religious laws, the laws of Moses, the clean things, the unclean things, the different lists, the regulations. They too will have been drummed into their memories by rote. Now, I don't have the time or the inclination to read it this morning, but Deuteronomy 14 is packed full of what animals you can eat and what animals you can't eat, what is clean and what is unclean. Peter, as a good Jewish boy, would be almost programmed to know, to live like that. And he'd have had this lens over his kind of perception of clean animals, unclean animals, clean people and spiritually unclean people. But now by Acts 10, our passage, the church was still very new. It was only a few years old and all the members were Jewish at this stage. It hadn't yet gone into all the world as it were. But this is God's plan. The only Jewish traditions that weren't being kept in the church at this time were firstly they weren't sacrificing animals because they recognised that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the, the system of animal sacrificing was leading up to Jesus, but Jesus was the fulfilment. And the other change was they were now meeting on the Sunday instead of a traditional Sabbath. They were meeting on the day that Jesus was resurrected as a way of respecting and celebrating that resurrection. But in every other way, these first Christians were still good Jews, keeping the Jewish traditions and laws in every way that other Jews also were. They were shaped by their culture and their upbringing, avoiding the unclean foods and unclean men. In fact, Peter was told off for actually going into Cornelius' house afterwards when he reported back. In Acts 11, 2-3, we read, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them? Now, we mustn't get too judgmental of the Jews, because it's easy to look at them and say, oh, how prejudiced they were, how awful. But we need to reflect on why they had got to that point in the first place. The histories, their history's lowest moments had come about through merging their culture, their God-given culture, with the cultures of the lands around them, which in those ancient times were pretty barbaric and we would consider, and the Jews would consider immoral at the time. So, for instance, some of the moral codes that were slipping in the back doors through the, the mixed marriages they were having were bringing in things like um, baby sacrifices, burning newborn babies to Molech. That was a, a relatively common practice in times of um, plague or drought as a way of trying to appease Molech. And it was something that some of the Jews started doing. Another thing that was becoming normal and accepted was a kind of legalised paedophilia, as you had temple boys and girls, prostitutes in the temples to Baal, for instance. That, too, was seen as a normal practice. And time and time again, God was sending the prophets to say, stop doing this, turn your ways, stop the killing stop the dehumanising, stop the evil. But the people didn't listen. They'd become so kind of enmeshed with the different cultures around them that they were literally kicked out of the land. And so they reached their most desperate time. And now coming forward in time to the first century, the Jews had kind of got so strict about staying apart from the other nations that it had become completely you know, it completely shaped their thinking. And in some ways, this wasn't such a bad thing. It had stopped them getting back into some of those old patterns, although they got into other bad ways. But what they had forgotten, uh, what they'd sort of become so extreme about, is that they'd forgotten that the prophets had always pointed ahead to the time. Their scriptures pointed ahead to the time when God would reach out to the whole world, to bring them in, to save the whole world. The Messiah, the Messiah that they were all looking forward to, was going to be a light to the Gentiles. In other words, if they'd have really have opened their mind to their scriptures, which they'd learnt up by heart, 
they'd have seen that the world, the Gentile world still mattered to God. And that time was still coming. And in fact, we know when Jesus came, it pronounced in history that the time has come for God to open the doors to the whole world. Now, just one of the customs that were going on at the time in Acts um, to kind of give us a sense of the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews had these really strict customs about washing anything that had been given to them by a Gentile. So they still had to buy some of their food stuff, especially if they lived in the Gentile cities in Jewish communities. They had to go to local traders, but they had really strict criteria for washing things to wash away spiritually the kind of religious evil that they believed was attached to it. Really rich Jews had these things called mikvahs. These were large baths that you could put furniture and big objects in to spiritually cleanse them. The only exception would be if that Gentile had converted to Judaism and had become circumcised. And of course, that's the point where we chaps start to think about what it must be like to have lived in an ancient time without good um, anesthesia and have undergone such operations as a routine thing. It wouldn't have been a great selling point to become a Jew. So why did God change this requirement? Why did God suddenly um, no longer require Gentiles to convert to Judaism if they were to be seen as one of his family? Well, in a word, it was baptism. Baptism replaced circumcision. So circumcision was the covenant, the agreement between people and their God. And now baptism was that sign, the inward sign. When somebody's baptised, we always say it's an outward expression, but baptism itself for water doesn't change anything. But it symbolises what's going on inside or should be going on inside if it's a real baptism. In other words, a decision to turn your life to God and turn your old life or turn yourselves away from your old life, your old ways, your old beliefs. Paul described it elsewhere as like a, a circumcision of the heart. So it's no longer about appearances. It's no longer about keeping lots of little laws and do lots of religious ceremonies. It's about having a changed heart. But it's hard. It requires change. People hate change. People are going to be resistive. This new church is going to be resistive to this idea that converts can just come in through baptism. That this practice they've been holding for thousands of years of circumcision was no longer necessary. And so how God brought about this change and this idea that uncircumcised Gentiles, people like us, you and I, unless you happen to be a Jew, how we could come into the faith. And he used a kind of test case, if you like. He took a man called Cornelius, a respectable man. He was liked by the Jews. We hear he was a God-fearing man, but he was still every bit a Gentile. And he's going to use this Cornelius to connect with a Jew. But which Jew do you change? Now, if I was God, ha ha, I'd probably be looking for a very moderate, fairly liberal, open-minded, easy-going kind of a Jew. It seems, though, that God chose the hardest to convince Jew in the whole of the church first. It's probably a good move, actually. Peter, the obstinate, the stubborn, the hard-headed man. Perhaps I'm being unfair, but I, I think we see lots of clues to Peter's stubbornness in the Gospels. And certainly here, I think the big clue that Peter was really hard to have his mind changed, that he was quite stubborn, was the fact that God had to give him this vision three times. It's the only place in scripture I can see God doing that. So God softened up Peter through that trance-like vision that he gave him three times to be able to go and see Cornelius. Peter still didn't know yet that it would lead to the fact that the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, that they can come into the family through this heart circumcision, through baptism. But he was going to, because 
As the commentary I read put it, Peter had to see to believe that God really was calling these people in. And how he did it was by giving him a really clear sign. These people received the Holy Spirit. They began to talk in tongues, these Gentiles. The Holy Spirit that Jesus promised to the church was now appearing in the Gentiles. So clearly God was in them, even though they weren't Jews or hadn't converted to Judaism. You couldn't get a more positive sign. I wonder if Jesus had to, sorry, if Peter had to turn to his friends and say, look, put your knives away, chaps. There's a change of plan. You won't need them after all because he took six circumcised friends with him. Maybe they expected to do a mass circumcision on the spot, but it wasn't necessary because God had moved already. And what Paul, what Peter, sorry, I keep on mixing those two up. What Peter saw was they didn't have to get circumcised to receive the Holy Spirit. They'd already received it. And so then he asked the obvious question, but if they've got the Holy Spirit in them, what's to stop us baptising it, putting the icing on the cake, officially declaring that they are part of the family of God? Change is never easy. Now, I'd like to suggest that this passage is in Scripture for two reasons. Firstly, to show that God is the God of the whole world, not just one nation. It he worked through that nation to reach the whole world, but it was never about having an elitist group of people. He's the God of all peoples. But secondly, I think it's in scripture because we need to know that change remains a part of our discipleship challenge, our discipleship walk, our experience. And are we modern Gentiles? Are we any less change aversive than those ancient religious Jews? I'd say not. You look whenever we try to change anything and any of the churches I've ever been to, when significant change has been mentioned, we all feel a sense of, oh no. And often that's just the little things like the colour of the curtains or the carpets or whatever. Is there nothing but God doesn't want to change in your life or in your church, our church, or are we perfect already? Is there no attitude, no prejudice that needs altering, no matter how discomforting that might be for us? I don't have any prophetic word. I haven't come today with a specific thing that God's laying on my heart for, for me, for you, for our church or anything like that. But I do know but change is never far away. God's been putting me out of my comfort zone for years now. Whenever I start to feel a little bit comfy, there's usually something around the corner. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? Who's going to walk into your church tomorrow or our church? That'll really challenge us ideas. I spoke to a leader recently who had somebody come into their church who just couldn't stop swearing, not because they were a nasty person, but because they'd always swore from being a very small child. And so they were constantly effing and blinding. And he knew they wasn't going to suddenly um, help this person to become a non-swearing person overnight because he's got to unlearn a habit literally of a lifetime of decades. And so the whole church was going to have to love and bear with and tolerate and be patient with that person, even though it was going to be incredibly hard. How about if that person walked into our church tomorrow? Or if God tells our church to give our finances to the poor? Or we have to remodel our chapel or who knows what? Now, I've just pulled those examples out of the air. But there's going to be some challenge some change just around the corner and when it comes how are we going to react so i suppose the final thing i'd like to say or ask is that when god introduces us to that change are we going to obey him 
Are we going to accept him? Or are we going to resist him? Let's quickly pray. Lord Father, help us to be open to your change. Not change for change's sake, but your change for your sake. Help us to have, have open minds and hearts to any change that might come along. When somebody suggests it, Lord, help us not to just close it off, but to weigh it up prayerfully. And if it's of you, Lord, help us to see, help us to accept and give us the strength and the courage to follow your path to the end. Lord, we pray that you will have your way in us, in our lives and in the life of our church family. Amen. Well, look, thanks so much for listening, uh, not just today, but for these past nine, ten months or so. Hopefully I'll see you soon in Pisgah or in some other forum. Do take care. Get in touch if you need to chat. I'm always here, always willing to lend an ear, even if it's just on the telephone. But stay safe and God bless.